Great. Thank you guys all for being here. Um, so we're talking about building your dream team uh, today. Go ahead and go on to the next slide. Um, I am Candace Elliott and I'm an HR consultant and I've been here in Santa Cruz for probably on the 12 to 13 year time frame too. Um, and I started out in human resources with the Glass Jar Restaurant Group, uh, which is, they have the Penny Ice Creamery and the Picnic Basket, and they used to have a restaurant here on Pacific called Assembly. Um, and I feel like I learned everything that there was to learn about what can happen with people in a company at that company. Um, but then every year there's something that happens that uh, is new and challenging. Um, so I've been at this for, yeah, uh, a little over 10 years, HR specifically. I have two kids, uh, and that means I don't sleep much anymore. Uh, they're little, two and seven, and we're doing this um, thing that's called A Thousand Hours Outside this year. Um, there's a podcast, and it's basically like you spend an average of three hours outside every day. It's the amount of time that you normally would spend on a device. Um, and it's been amazing. Like my kid who's two is like an epic climber and jumper and all of these things now and he wasn't before. So um, I focus on providing HR services to small businesses. So those with, you know, up to 30 employees. Um, I'm not great at the like sort of uh, bigger, you know, the, the 30 to 100 employee zone. Um, but that first sort of 30 set is where I really shine. Um, and yeah, go ahead, go to the next slide. Um, today we're going to talk about workforce planning, hiring best practices, and then building a strong and healthy team culture, and especially how that relates to the younger generations. Um, go ahead, next slide. So when we're thinking about workforce planning, especially when, the, when we're in the early stage, we're thinking about finding people and, um, and positions that are doing these things. So they are saving time, specifically um, your time as the organization, head of the organization, um, that are saving your energy. So they're um, focusing on tasks that are using up a lot of your energy. They might not take a lot of your time, but they take a lot of your uh, life force. And then also creating value and impact. So creating the value and impact that your organization is bringing into the world. And I should say business. I say organization a lot because I work with both nonprofits and for-profits, but we're businesses here. So um, go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, so when you're planning a workforce, um, and I talked with most of you, I didn't get to you too, but um, about the, hi, welcome. We're just getting started, so no worries. <laughs> um, so we're just talking about workforce planning um, and talking about the difference between independent contractors and employees. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit more of the nuances between independent co contractors versus employees. Um, when you're thinking about choosing an independent contractor, there's there are all these tests, like legal and IRS-based tests, that we need to do in order to determine whether or not someone can be an independent contractor. If they don't meet the requirements of those tests, then they need to be an employee. Um, and so with employees, there are some requirements that you, you like, you just have to do these things um, if you have employees. So you have to run payroll for most employees at least twice a month. Um, so on, you could do like first and the 15th, or you could do every two weeks. Those are the most sort of common ways to pay people. You have to have workers' compensation insurance. Um, you should have a good understanding of wage, hour, and other employment laws. Um, there are a lot of wage and hour laws, like you shift length laws and break laws and things like that, that if you have hourly employees, you will need to know and abide by. And if you have exempt employees, so those are more highly compensated employees, they have to be in specific um, job categories, you don't have those same wage and hour considerations. Um, but you do have all these other laws that you have to follow in California, like leaves of absence come to mind. There's like 10 different kinds of leaves of absence that are unpaid in California that you're required to give to your employees. Um, and those are always like little flags that should come up in your head. Um, 
when the when people request certain kinds of time away. Um, so I know all of these things because I've been doing this for a really long time, and that's why people sometimes come to me for help because um, it's just easy for me to come up, you know, from my memory and um, you know the education that I've had through all this time to just know what applies in a given situation and be able to point you to the resource. Um, I already talked about part-time hourly and full-time salary, but um, yeah, go ahead, go to the next slide. So an independent contractor looks a certain way. Um, and when you have an audit happen, this is kind of what you want the person to look like. So they have a high level of skill, they're directing their own work, and they're able to set their own schedule. They perform work that is ancillary to the work that is the primary work of your business. So they're not, for example, a client-facing person. Um, they're doing work that is, you know, it may be a part of the delivery that goes to a client, but it is not um, necessarily the person who is the client-facing person. Um, they may own their own company and generally do similar work for other companies. It's typical for this to be the kind of thing that they do. Um, go ahead and move to the next slide. An employee looks different. With an employee, you're directing the work and you are deciding on their schedule. You can tell them when and where they're working. You can also have flexible work hours with employees and say that they can do their work at any time if you want to. Um, they, are, they can be and are generally client facing and they're doing work that is the same as the primary work of your business. So let's say I have a marketing agency and I have someone who is uh, meeting with my clients about their marketing projects. That would typically be an employee rather than an independent contractor. There are caveats to all of this, um, so I'm going to get to those. Um, but an employee is um, not owning their own company, um, and usually is you know working for one other company. They might be just working for you. That the sort of relationship there is that they're not usually owning their own business and contracting with your business, for example. Um, so you might have, for example, an account manager <coughs> who's the one who's the employee who's doing all the client interaction, and then have an engineer or some folks on the back end who are doing doing all of the work. Um, so the engineers and folks on the back end could be contracted. Heck has its own special rules about independent contractor relationships too. Um, and then, so that's one way to break it up. Yeah, so you end up with less employees and more contractors, yeah. So yeah, so the legal pieces are interesting. Um, you can cover a lot of your liability through your independent contractor agreement. Um, you know, with regard to how your contractor is, um, per, like, uh, performing their responsibilities for your organization. Um, your, your business, though, could have liability for paying missed wages and, um, like, missed breaks and um, all of those kinds of things. There are penalties for misclassifying a person as an independent contractor rather than an employee if they're supposed to be an employee. So there's like workers' compensation that needs to be paid. There's, um, you know, different kinds of, of wage and hour things that happen. <laughs> um, and it's usually an audit that happens by EDD or um, it can come up in IRS um, audits. Um, and that's how it happens. One of our friends just went through one and she passed. It's great. <laughs> Um, yeah, other questions? Okay, next slide. Okay, so if you're hiring independent contractors, I put together this, it's a very rough tool right now, it's a spreadsheet situation, um, but if you're hiring independent contractors and you want to sort of do go through all the tests that there are to figure out if they actually qualify as an independent contractor or not, then you can use this QR code to get to the tool that I use. I will make it more beautiful in the future. Right now, it's very functional. <laughs> um, yeah, and if for some reason that doesn't work to bring it up, I can forward it to the group. 
Great. Um, so the way that it works is that you look through the job categories on the first page and it'll kind of tell you which tab to go to to the next page um, and which kinds of tests apply in your given situation. Because like I said, tech is different from, um, you know, finance is different from HR. And if you're trying to do a business to business contract is different from a business to a person contract. And um, what I have there is specific to California. So one thing that I want to say is that um, if you're hiring a contractor in another state other than California, we have the ABC rule, which is a very strict rule about how um, you classify someone as a contractor or not. Um, if you hire a contractor who is in another state, it looks like those don't apply. <laughs> uh, the, the ABC rule does not apply there. So there are other tests that you would use in that situation. So this is a way to help with that. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to dig into independent contractor versus employee. Thanks. Yeah. So global, so it's interesting to think about global because just as if you hire an employee in another state, you have to set up your company in another state. Um, if you hire an employee in another country, you have to set up your business as an employer in that country or you need to use a special service um, yeah or remote or so rippling will work to facilitate that across the u.s um, and then there are other ones like remote that are better if you're going to go international um, but generally starting out in relationships with people who are international in the independent contractor category um, is helpful. <laughs> That's a generalist statement that, and it can be different depending on the situations, but especially if you're early stage startup like you are, um, starting with that and then potentially transitioning into employment can be good. I just had to fire someone in Sweden and it was very tricky. So there are com like countries that are easier to do employment in, um, and there are countries that are harder, just like there are states that are easier and states that are harder. Like a red state in general is going to be easier to hire an employee in than a blue state. Okay. Well, <laughs> bye. <laughs> All right. Next. Oh, any more questions related to independent contractors, employees? I mean, we could probably talk like for weeks about it, but yeah. Anything? Okay. Um, so interview process. When you're going out to hire someone and you're going through the interview process, it's good to think ahead of time before you get into it, what do you need to vet the person for? What do you need to know if they're going to be able to do or not do? Um, this can look like having a conversation with them and asking. It could look like creating some kind of a test. Like if you're hiring for a finance position, you might want to have some kind of a test that verifies that they know how to do math. <laughs> Um, or, you know, the vetting process can look different ways depending on the position that you're hiring for. Um, but it's good to start out with that. Um, what is the skill set that you're looking for? So you're clearly communicating that in a job ad that's going out so that someone can self-identify, do I have that skill set or not? You're going to get people who are going to think that they have it and they don't. So just realize that. What questions do you need to ask to find out if they actually have that skill set? So this is thinking about interviewing um, in addition to getting to know you, you know, you know, having job and skills based questions so that you can determine who's going to be a good fit, who can actually do this job. Um, thinking about what else is important for you to know about this person and then um, consider requesting, depending on what you're hiring for, a por portfolio and references. Um, I really love references. It can even be just sending a survey out to a reference to get some um, feedback about the person, especially when you're hiring a, sorry, um, like a high level or if there are not very many people in the company and it's a really important, you know, new, like uh, early stage hire. Uh, getting references about other people that they've worked with is really, really important because um, you can just learn things. I mean, it's better to have a conversation with the reference. You can get things out of verbal cues that you can't get out of um, a survey. But anyway, 
next next slide. So and now just to talk about the difference between hiring an independent contractor versus an employee. So that process of from the last slide is going to be pretty much the same regardless of what you decide independent contractor or employee. But when you hire an independent contractor, it looks different from an employee. So you might have an informational call with them. They're probably going to submit a proposal to you. You're going to review their proposal. You're going to select which independent contractor you're going to go with, assuming there are multiples that are coming to you. Um, and then there's going to be the drafting of an independent contractor agreement that may come from them, or you may have developed one that you want to use. Um, there's invoicing, so the independent contractor is going to invoice you, and you're going to be paying them that way. You're going to go through some sort of process of setting up and sharing systems and, you know, and communicating um, communication guidelines and all of that. And then you will have contract renewal typically with an independent contractor. It's a discrete amount of time that a person will be working for you in this kind of relationship. So it could be six months, it could be a year, but you want to have something that is um, creating an end to the relationship and a time to be able to make changes and start it again. This is one of the keys that makes an independent contractor different from an employee. And so I see a lot in organizations, they bring on an independent contractor and they just keep doing the work for a long time. And that's great. And this can be sort of a formality, but it is good to check in with them every year and, you know, review what happened, talk about what's coming up um, and, and do a renewal. Next slide. An employee is more like you're reviewing resumes. So instead of... Um, you know, going out and finding someone to do work um, that is like maybe, uh, how, how am I describing this? Like you're talking, you're bringing, you're putting a project out to the world or um, you're promoting that you, your company needs help with a certain type of work. You're creating an actual job ad. So you're saying, this is the job that I have in my company that I would need this person to do. Like, I'm going to be likely hiring an HR consultant. They're going to be client facing, like that is the job. The next thing that, I'm, that is a part of that step is reviewing resumes. Um, so they're going to send in resumes usually or portfolios and you go through those and you um, compare those to what you're looking for and you choose someone um, or a group of people to interview. I recommend to not interview more than 10 people for any one position. If you're interviewing everyone who has applied, you're not being um, clear enough about what your requirements are for the position because I never have seen like 40 people be good for a job. <laughs> like there's usually, there's maybe two people of all the ones that have applied that are really the right fit for it. So you need to be clear about what you need in the beginning before you go out and waste a bunch of time interviewing a whole bunch of people that you don't actually need to spend time on. We already talked about references. Um, then you would go through a process of candidate selection. Um, and so in the process of interviews, if you have other people in your organization that you want to also you know, participate in that process, um, have a plan for how you're going to go about that. And don't put your candidates through like seven or 10 rounds of interviews. You should be able to do it in two to three rounds, regardless of the role and how advanced it is and even how big your organization is. Um, you create a job offer. You as the employer create the job offer rather than the independent contractor creating the, the contracting agreement. Um, and your job offer should have a job description. And then you move on to like payroll, eventually having an employee handbook, you know, doing training and feedback and those kinds of processes. Training and feedback don't happen with independent contractors. They should be at a high enough level where they don't require that. Like you might have to train on your specific systems for how to do a thing, but you shouldn't have to train them on their job responsibilities. Next slide. Sorry, that was a lot. Questions? <laughs> Comments? I just wondered, um, yeah. some of the, I think it's, I know the answer, but if some of the absolute do not ask these questions, um, like, how old are you? Mm -hmm. Wait. Are you pregnant? Are you thinking of getting pregnant? <laughs> yeah. Are you going to have a baby? Are you married? Um, are you married? Yeah. Uh, they reply to both contractors and, and uh, perspective. 
Yeah. 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 Um, equal employment opportunity laws protect employees, um, but discrimination laws protect people in general in the United States. And so those protected categories that you're talking about, like disability or, um, yeah, even if you ask where a person is from, that can be one. Really? Uh-huh. Because if a person is from another country. Oh, I see. You know, that it can be perceived as discriminatory if you if you end up not hiring them and you have an employee group that is homogenous and different from them, if that makes sense. Yeah. You just keep the conversation yeah. about the job and yeah. you're good <laughs> in the in the interview process. You know, you can get to know each other like more. I mean, it's also like you want to know about a person personally, especially if it's a small group. And also, there are those legal pieces that are around discrimination that you just don't want to especially get into the hiring process. Go ahead. What if the person talks a lot and gives information to you? Then you just don't use it to consider whether or not to hire them. They can share it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, and you, like if someone is, you know, for example, sharing with you that they're going to have a baby in six months during the interview process, then you want to really think about and check with legal counsel before you decide not to hire that person if you have some, if they are the most or one of the most highly qualified ones for the role. Um, you're, you're trying to determine both skill set and cultural fit uh -huh. at the same time. So that's where some of the personal stuff. And it usually will come out during conversations anyway, even if you have questions that are really related to the job. Yeah. All right. Um, oh, in the hiring process, also just getting back to people where it's a no, like tell them that it's a no if it's a no for you. Don't leave them hanging. But if they ask you why, I always say don't say anything, just like don't respond because <laughs> that's a whole, it can be a whole legal trap and there are people who actually like try to interview to try to get people to tell them things that are um, discriminatory in that being declined process. Um, and so it's like a scam that's out there that, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do a, a thank you so much for um, interviewing, we decided to go with a candidate who more closely met the qualifications for the position. And that's it. So attracting talent, um, focusing on like three things is where I go usually. So building relationships. So you guys all have relationships. We're all building relationships with each other. Um, that's essential in attracting talent, like getting out and meeting people, um, especially being able to hire people that you trust um, and that are going to be able to do good work for you and good work for the community. Um, paying competitively is really important. Um, and so one of the things that I do is compensation analysis, where I look at um, similarly situated jobs and other companies, and we look at how much those companies are paying and um, how your pay is relative to those jobs, those other jobs. Um, and so sometimes I work with companies that are finding themselves right at the 50% mark, and that's great. That's kind of what you shoot for. Other times I work with companies that are more on the 10% side, um, and then they make goals for being able to increase pay over a certain amount of time to be able mostly to retain people better. Um, other times I work with companies that are on the other end where they're paying like 90% or higher of the median and those companies end up having challenges if they're trying to go through a period of growth and they're using all these resources on these positions that are extremely highly compensated and they're trying to add more people into the organization. So it, um, it, it is challenging budget wise for them, so, but it's a choice to be in these different categories. Um, the living wage in Santa Cruz right now is almost $28 an hour, and that's just for basic living expenses. That's like paying your rent, food, medical, like being able to fix your car if it breaks kind of world, not like taking vacations or not like, you know, getting the new fancy car or the new fancy like 
technology or anything like that. Like just for people to maintain the status quo is $28 an hour here. Um, it's 32 in Marin. There are other parts of California where it's like 17. <laughs> um, and then I use MIT's living wage calculator when I'm looking at living wages. So you can actually look at any county in the US um, what, it, what the living wage is there. Um, and they break it out by um, the, the household size. So if there's a single person, no kids, single person, one kid, you know, two earners and how many kids. And so you can see it gets really quickly up into like $75 an hour for one person working and two kids. Um, then benefits are a thing to think about. So like as you grow, there are different benefits that make sense. Um, this is uh, in the employee sort of category here. Um, so retirement is one of the ones that's mandated by the state. Um, so you can do that through a state-sponsored program or you can um, do like a 401k or something like that. Um, then net, often after that, like after sort of bonuses and profit sharing, um, companies start thinking about um, medical, dental, and vision benefits, um, professional development benefits, and things like that. These all help keep people. Okay, go ahead. So it's just a specific question about the minimum wage. Um, the same minimum wage would apply for everything. Not minimum wage. It, this is a living wage. Different from minimum wage. The minimum wage is, I think, $15 an hour right now in California. Yes. And in the state of California, different like different cities have different minimum wages. And now, like, fast food workers also have their own minimum wage. So depending on the location of the employee, not the company, but the location of the employee and the industry, that determines what the minimum wage is. So if you don't have Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So our minimum wage is pretty much half of what a person actually needs to live here. So like it's it's crazy. <laughs> and I feel like it's actually unethical to pay that little. Um, and also it's like our responsibility to create businesses that create jobs that pay people a living wage so that we can have a well-resourced and, and safe-feeling society. Um, OK, next slide. I, can, I get into the, yeah. Yeah, so in the earlier stage of uh, small business, um, I see stipends of like up to $2,000 a year, usually, for professional development. Um, so for reimbursement for um, you know, conferences or courses or things like that. Um, and then there could also separate to that, which kind of can be learning and development or maybe not um, technology stipends. So I've seen those range from like 500 to 2000 a year, depending on what the company does <laughs> and the technology needs of the employees. Okay, and my second question goes back to the technology yeah. because and I get what you're saying. You're giving us kind of a warning on the legal side about what not to say if somebody doesn't get mm -hmm. job. But these people who have gone through interviewing with you are essentially your alumni. Yeah. Some have had an interaction with you. They're going to share that interaction. One of the worst things that I keep hearing from people is the fact that, yeah, they got a response, but absolutely no content. Mm. So while I understand you didn't want to say something about a deficit that they might have or they could defensive about it or twist it or anything that way, can you get around it by highlighting something about the candidate you went with or something that was something so that, and particularly if, if these people, I don't think it's one interview, that's nothing. Yeah. If you've gone to second or third round, you've given all this time, sometimes you're asked to do certain things and you're given nothing but a standard, even if it's to protect the company, it can leave a very bad taste in the mouth of somebody. And you might want to hire them later for another position. Yeah, I would say that definitely you can do that. You would just want to have a process in place that would that would be protective if you're doing it. Um, so you, I would recommend that you would have someone look at what you're going to send to the employee or to the to the declined candidate just to check yeah. the legal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you're going to do it, just 
have a review first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I get, I get that too. It's important to keep building the community and it could be that the person isn't the right fit for this role, but potentially in the future, a different role could be good. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah, and I think if you keep it like exactly to that, like job skills based, and that is really why you made the choice that you made. It's just people can make all kinds of choices about who they're hiring for all different kinds of reason, including biases that they're not even aware that they're doing. Yeah. It's because you don't know how to serve. Right, it's because we can't go serving. <laughs> no, you cut me off. Like, come on, you dropped yeah. in on me. <laughs> all right, uh, which brings us to building relationships. Um, yeah, so I don't know that I need to talk in more detail about this. You guys are, I think, probably really, you know, you, there are community organizations that you can belong to to build your relationships, like this one, newsletters from your company, social media. You can attend conferences or you can speak at conferences, um, participating in mentorship programs like the two of you are doing right now. Um, I have a mentorship program in my company where I mentor early stage HR professionals, um, which is kind of a chess play move to eventually hopefully hire them. <laughs> um, and then um, giving paid internships. Um, so people who are early career can um, earn income while also learning. Um, and there are a lot of great programs for this actually locally where you can get support from the Workforce Development Board, for example, to do a six-month internship and they'll pay for, I think, like up to $15 an hour, $20 an hour. can't remember what it is right now. Next slide. Yeah, so mentorship is a more informal relationship um, and an internship is more formal. Um, you have to be like think about if you're doing internships if you're a for-profit company it's tough to do that and not pay um so the best guideline is to pay at least minimum wage or to have a relationship with a local college where they're getting credit for them for the work yeah uh we're almost done guys i know i've been talking for a long time i skipped the slide about um pay because we, i already covered that um but in the world of benefits these are kind of the main categories so we've got time so the and this is primarily for employees that i'm talking about here so there's sick leave uh, pto vacation or flex time or um this is called sometimes called like unlimited time off i hate that term unlimited time off because it's not unlimited um and deciding which kind of permutation of these is right for your organization is a thing that we could talk about. Um, sometimes it makes sense to do something like an unlimited policy, and then sometimes it just doesn't. Um, it was Netflix that started the uh, yeah no PTO. Yeah, which right. is cool because then you don't have to pay it out when they finish working for you. Right. But right. <laughs> it was like yeah, it's new with this. Yeah, we're gonna talk horror stories, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, I mean a lot of times. Like, if there isn't the appropriate emphasis on taking time away, it can be that people don't take enough time away. And so if it is an environment that is where people, where the workload is really too much for what the people should be doing, then it doesn't work well to have an unlimited time off because nobody will take time. And then they're not earning it. And it just is awful. If you have the like an appropriate amount of work for the people in the organization and there is an emphasis on like mental health and taking time away and enjoying your life outside of work, then it can work, but also still not always. <laughs> um, there's also um, alternative work schedules that you can create. So like doing four tens or like, which is where you work four days, but you have it and you have a 10 hour shift instead of working five days and having an eight hour shift. But you have to like actually legally adopt that within your employee pool um, in order to do it and not be liable for overtime. So if you just start, you know, like if you convert your people and you're like, cool, we're going to start doing four tens now. You guys now have to work 10 hours a day and you don't start paying them the overtime and they haven't actually adopted it the way they're supposed to, then you're liable for those um, overtime hours. 
there's a lot of research that says that it's um, more uh, like it, it helps people to be more productive uh, and uh, has positive effects on mental health. What, what about the other two given like daily five hour a week? Yeah. I mean, they don't really take tra like there's not actually a lot of traction within U.S. companies to do things like that in general. Like, you know, here we're like you need to work 60 hours a week, and <laughs> I'm not going to pay you for the extra 20 that you have to work to get your job done. Like that's still pretty much the standard, I would say, in most companies. The companies that I work with more are on the trying to move away from that sort of model, that model. <laughs> the exploitative model. So which model? Yeah, I'm just wondering which one would be the most effective. Um, so I like in designing like the workforce in like my own company, I'm gonna go with a 32 hour work week for people, but paying so yeah, because I think that that's my own sort of moral um and like I have a different understanding of the sustainability of working. 40 hours a week because I have autoimmune things that come up and I um, have two small kids and I have a lot of responsibilities outside of work um, and I'm also running a company so like I also want my employees to be able to um, to have good not like work-life balance but I want to decrease the conflict between work and life um, so this is not something that I would do Thank you. This is not something that I would do because it would not be sustainable for me to work for 10 hour days every single week. Um, but it is for a lot of people. And that is like different times of life. There are different things that work and don't work. So um, did you have a question? Well, I, I looked at your website and I saw yeah. you talking about regenerative. Mm -hmm. Is that something, and I'm hearing that more and more, I have a friend who's kind of specializing in it, but yeah. is that becoming more understood or still, still very early? It's pretty early. It's pretty early. Yeah, it's pretty early. People are coming to you. They're, they're not often coming with that word. You're often bringing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so the idea is that we're, my back, there's a lot of my background that is in, you know, organic farming. Um, and so an idea there is um, we want to create an ecosystem that is, um, you know, where it is regenerative, where we have, you know, certain plants that are giving nutrients back into the soil. We have certain animals that are on the land that are fertilizing it in different ways that we're rotating different crops. And so we're um, creating like an ecosystem that works well. It's man-made, right? It's being put onto the land by me or the farmer, whoever is doing it. Um, but it is meant to um, regenerate. Um, yeah, and so it's taking those principles and applying it into work. A um, couple more benefits, and then we'll get to more conversation. Um, there's lots of insurances. Uh, this one's real expensive, <laughs> but once you start doing this one, it makes sense to do pretty much all of them. Um, I just got a quote for disability insurance for a five-person company that was like $200 a year for everybody, um, and it's amazing. It, it would pay out like $2,700 per employee per month. So like, anyway, if you're getting into this world, let me know. I have people I can connect you with. Um, savings. So there's, you know, your general retirement savings accounts. QSERA is a type of account that you can use for medical insurance premium payments. So if you want to help people pay for medical insurance with pre-tax dollars, this is something you could consider setting up before you get into the technicalities of offering an actual plan, which comes with it, like the increase in renewal of the, the renewal every year, which can be 2% or it can be like 15%, depending on what's going on. Um, there are health savings accounts. Um, I put tuition reimbursement under savings. It's not really a savings, but um, it is another kind of financial benefit um, that you can do tax, advantaged up to, I think it's $5,250 a year for your employees, um, for each employee. And then these are other kinds of benefits. So tech stipend uh, or reimbursement, professional development. There's donation matching. So um, 
I work with a small nonprofit that does a hundred dollars of donation matching a year, or you could, you know, set whatever you want it to be, bonuses and profit sharing. And I think that brings us to um yeah. How are we on time, Doug? I feel like I've been talking for a long time. How are we on time? Twelve thirty seven. Okay. And we go till one fifteen. Yeah, Cool. All right. Let's so this is pretty well known. So let's skip to the next slide. Um, so thinking about like work like trends in the workforce or like general like society stuff that's going on. So um, and the reason that I bring this up, if we're sort of moving into the territory of talking about culture, is that like as a business, we have the uh, role of creating a culture and we can intentionally create a culture. Well, culture is going to happen regardless. We can be intentional about what it's going to look like or it can be created by the defaults of just what happens. Um, and the business is sort of in this place that is between society and the individual, right? And the forces that are at work in society and in the individual like mix in the business. And the business can do things to protect the individual from, say, market forces and upheaval and different things. Um, and they can also like in that they're also like filtering through what is getting passed down to the employee so when we think about that relationship there's this like increasing cost of goods is happening right now right there's that that's tied to wages increasing we live within this capitalist system where as the cost of things increases the wages increase and it's sort of this never ending like cycle that we're in, right? So we're always trying to keep the wages at pace with the rate of inflation. And there are all kinds of mechanisms that happen at the you know, governmental level in order to affect how that balance is and creating the right tension between the income people are receiving and what the cost of goods is. And the business is in the middle of that, not just in the product pricing that you have, but also in the way that you pay your employees and the way that you create value for your clients and then how that value is passed through to your employees and passed through also to the company. So it's like a, that's a thing. There's, you know, in the US we have relative to European countries, a very weak social infrastructure. So that means that we're responsible as businesses for providing things like health insurance which is ridiculous if you think about it, right? Like, why should my business be up in the medical situations of my employees? There's a lot of laws that talk about how I'm not supposed to actually have any information about the medical situations of my employees. And there's lots of things about sharing and not sharing that stuff. Um, so it, when we have, as we have made the choice to not invest in social infrastructure um, and to give power to businesses, it also gives responsibilities to businesses. And one of those that comes to mind is, is medical insurance, especially. And there is also this thing of, of pay and how we equitably pay relative to not just other businesses, but the cost of what living is. In the United States, six out of 10 of us have chronic illnesses. So I have one. Four out of 10 of us have two or more chronic illnesses. So people are you know, generally not healthy, right? Like it's different in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz tends to have a pretty healthy population, but we still have a lot of people who have chronic illness. And so this is like high, high or low blood pressure, um, you know, autoimmune diseases and different things like this. Um, and 80% of people during their life, so this comes from um, the Surgeon General. This comes from um, the Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, did a study with hiring our heroes um, on mental health and found that 80% of people are going to have a mental health crisis during their work life. Um, and so I don't know if any of you have experienced a mental health crisis, but I have experienced one, actually multiple of them. And so we as employers are dealing with this, right, in like the day-to-day -day of the work. And so how do we care for and create systems that 
um, support people who are going through this while also delivering our product, you know, or delivering our service and um, ensuring that uh, our clients are having a great experience, right? So this is like that tension and these are the bigger, bigger ideas. Yeah, so like my own that I can talk about that like I think would be an example is that I had this like, it was, um, I was in a very busy time at work there were a lot of competing demands and there was a lot of pressure that was coming at me. Um, and I completely broke. Like I couldn't breathe. I like was crying. Like I could not get my body under control. Right. It just was like freaking out. Um, to the point where I went to see a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist was like, there's nothing wrong with you. You're fine. Get back to work. Like you're good. Um, and it, yeah, or like he said, no, I'm not going to prescribe. I wasn't looking for medicine. I was looking for mental health support, right? Which I wasn't getting from the medical system um, and since have found ways to, to do that um, through um, like counselors and, you know, business coaches and people like that that are trauma informed. Um, but that's all paid not through my medical insurance, right? There was a whole process of me being like, oh, I need a particular kind of help. And I have to, even though I can't really afford it at this time, pay for this thing in order to like help me get through this crisis that I was in. Um, so that's kind of what I'm talking about. It's like you can't. Like, it could also be like your parent dies, and you just can't like. It could be, you know, if it affects your ability to show up and do your job, and you can't get out of your sadness. sadness. If it if it is bringing up severe depression and anxiety, yeah, the then it would be yeah. Then it would be if okay. if it's not if it's if you're because many people are able to cope with very difficult things and it's fine, and then other people are not, or it gets to a point where there's a breaking point for someone. Um, yeah. 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 Program, you get maybe ten visits uh, with a therapist, but do you think that this model is good? Do you have any other recommendations? Yeah, I think that model can be helpful if the employees feel like it's safe to utilize the program, the EIP program. Sometimes employees, they, those programs can have a lot of like underutilization because people don't understand what it is, or they don't trust that the information will be kept from their employer. So that's one. That's something to think about. But yes, they can be very helpful. All right, next slide. Yeah, last one. Just like with culture, it's about building community and it's about relationships and building relationships with people. People are people. They're going to have good days. They're going to have bad days. Things are going to be all over the place. Just keep that in mind. Um, and I know like the godfather is like business is business. It's not personal. But I think that business is really personal because we're, we're people. We're people who are working together. And we have moments that are big wins and they're amazing. And we have moments that are really, really hard. And um, they're, we have arguments with each other. And we uh, try to avoid each other. And then we try to come back together again. And like it's just complex. And so um, having... Give, give yourself some grace and understanding as you're um, navigating all the challenges of employing people. It's rough. Um, yeah, and that's it. Questions and discussion and all that. Thanks.